Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Scrum Down NBC Sports Rugby Podcast. I am your host with the most, Alex Corbisero, and there is lots to talk about. Uh, there's huge news going on at the moment that Eddie Jones has been removed as England head coach. Lots to unfold there and to really get into it and talk about it. Um, we've got an all-star little panel together. We've got Chris Jones, friend of the pod, BBC Union rugby correspondent, and Alex Lowe from the Times uh, rugby correspondent as well to sort of break it down, get into all of that. And then also here on NBC, the World Rugby 7 Series kicked off again, the new season continuing um, in Dubai this weekend, and it was a big event. And to go through that, to break it down, get some insight and also a bit of fun as well. At the end of the pod, we have Kayvon Williams and Nia Tapper, the two captains from the US team to talk through. So hang around for the end of the pod for that. But let's get into the Alex Lowe, Chris Jones chat on Eddie Jones. And here we are, mate. The Avengers have assembled. Uh, we have Chris Jones uh, from the BBC and we have Alex Lowe from the Times. You know what that means. There's lots of news going on in the rugby world right now and seismic shocks sent around the rugby world as Eddie Jones has been dismissed as England head coach. Uh, Richard Cockrell is now the interim coach for the time being. Uh, lads, welcome to the pod. And then also just get your uh, initial opening reactions as well. Chris, go first. Well, what a what a dream. What a dream team you've assembled here. I mean, they, they, they've been asking for this for years. <laughs> it's combination. Two of your favorites on the we'll scrum down. Yeah. Um, Oh, look, it's the end of an era, isn't it? Um, I, I know that the plan was for Eddie Jones to to finish next year and sail off into a, a Parisian sunset, clutching the, the, the trophy that's eluded him. But you, it's almost fitting that the turbulence of the seven years would end in this way. You know, that obviously everyone involved in English rugby would have hoped it, it would have ended as planned, but it's Eddie Jones and things don't always go to plan. And now we reflect on a very eventful seven years, seven years that will split the room. Pe some people will say seven years that saw England return as a superpower. Others will say seven years that were up and down, you know, highs and lows. And in the end, a team that, that threatened to be great, but never quite managed it. So, yeah, lots to discuss when you when you talk about this, um, this period of English rugby. Yeah, it's a massive contradictions, isn't it? The, the last seven years, the, the highs of, of those first two years, was it 23 wins out of 24, record equaling 18 wins in a row, reaching the World Cup final. Um, just a huge like um, impetus that he gave to the game in England after that World Cup in 2015. And so you, you've got that. You've got the, a lot of people in the grassroots game um, will have great things to say about all the work Eddie did away from the spotlight, going to local clubs and and always being available for pictures and and and, and a chat with kids. And I've got people who live around the corner here who, who whose kids you know, were really excited and benefited from that. Then you've got the con the controversies and the um, uh, and, and and some of the comments that were made about other players, about other teams, about referees, and then you've got the results over the last few weeks, few months. Um, maybe a few years even really since that 2019 World Cup no real consistency no identity uh, and real by the end just apathy and disillusionment from the English rugby public that that it's come to this so like a, just a real mass of contradictions which which sums up the way that he coaches as much as anything else no it's 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 crazy because you know you look at Eddie's first four years um you know he inherited a a pretty well blooded squad of core like guys who had had a lot of caps time together not quite maybe achieved the success that the team was capable of you know a failed 2015 world cup but he really benefited from that four years of Lancaster sort of blooding a lot of those players building a squad then you add Eddie on top with some great coaches. I think the first four years, one of the key aspects for me with Eddie is he had an incredible staff around him going into that World Cup final in 2019. You saw a massive uptick, but that sort of, you know, you know, picturesque sort of sunset moment of him winning that World Cup in 2019, that was really his chance. And probably something that will haunt him a bit like 2003 with Australia, like, and then after that, you know, it, it was a clear change of tack. Like, I don't think he's the guy 
that is well equipped to like rebuild a squad. I think he's a little bit too cut in and out with selection. Like the amount of guys in this last four years that have like one or two, three caps who he, he tried, didn't quite like, pulled out. That's not the recipe for like a, a rebuild or to regenerate. I think he was trying to hold on to most of what he had from 2019, but it, sometimes experiment, reinvent it. I don't think it ever truly came to fruition. And I, and I think gradually now that sort of lack of identity and also just, I don't think he's got the best coaching staff under him. Like without trying to be disrespectful to any of the coaches in the room, they're all great coaches, but Eddie Jones in the first four years could basically assemble his Avengers of who's who of coaching. Now it's very hard for him to convince any name coaches to come in under him. That sort of, you know, turmoil and, and turnover of coaches underneath him to me is really what is his undoing because I think if he'd managed to have the right staff around him I think he would have survived to this World Cup and then probably left at that sort of time on, on more his terms but that that's really kind of my assessment. Mm, I think that's a really key point about the assistant coaches and that's where analyzing Eddie Jones's legacy is quite hard because you're right. His brief at the start was to get England winning again, get them back to the big time in in, in, in Test rugby, having been kind of embarrassed on on home soil. You know, they, they, those were such a games of margins in 2015, but ultimately they were knocked out at the pool stage and need to be picked up from the floor. Eddie Jones did that magnificently in 16 and 17. 18 was a really dodgy year. It looked like things were going to unravel. He just about got it back and did did really well going into 19 and and obviously got within 80 minutes of the trophy. That was probably the time to go, wasn't it? In hindsight, easy for us to say sitting here, you know, we're not, on the, on the, we're not at the coal face, we're not at the sharp end of coaching. But that's when you would think he had achieved his remit. England were back at the top table, at the big time, in the final. That was probably the time. So a combination of him and the RFU, I think got a, a little bit, you know, too carried away with and just, just reached for a little bit too much. And on the assistant coaches front, he, he unfortunately leaves an English rugby picture that for me is quite disjointed between the club game and the England team. It should be the case that when he's looking for a defence coach, he's got five across the premiership. Yes, they would all be in contract, but the relationships could be so strong between the RFU and the Prem clubs that the England team should be able to go, right, I've got five here. Who do you want? They've all ticked the boxes with their Prem experience. They can step up. It doesn't feel like that, does it? The England coach needs to have these great relationships with the clubs whereby it should be aspirational for English club coaches in the Premiership to coach their country. And the fact he's been plucking people from all over the place, a lot coming from the NRL, another guy's about to start who's never coached Union, no doubt a really <laughs> talented coach. But it's another pick, you know, if fans are twicking and scratching their head. Like, you know, there's guys at the clubs who could do that job and instead he's going to the NRL or going to Super League. So those are the things that he'll leave English rugby in a bit of a hole. But he also leaves English rugby with some amazing memories and some performances and some achievements that few previous coaches have managed. So it's again, it's that big kind of enigmatic picture of not quite knowing how to analyse the Eddie Jones regime. <laughs> Corbs, I think your point about um, he's not a, a coach to, to rebuild a team, to reboot a team has been has been so evident, really. I remember in the in the tunnel, really, at the after the World Cup final, he said, this England team is dead. We're going to have to build a new team. That was the youngest team to reach a World Cup final. He's like, team's done. Got to rebuild it. Then he came out with his, um, his sort of moonshot um, ambition of build the greatest team that's ever played rugby. Um, and they kind of stumbled to a Six Nations win in 2020, then crashed in 21. Then he relaunched again with the New England, dropped a load of Saracens players, and then was almost handing out caps like confetti, like you say, trying to trying to find this new team. And he ends up back where he was. And if you look at the England starting 15 now, there's one player who is in that 15 who hadn't trained with England before 2019 World Cup, and that's Freddie Stewart. Jack Van Portfleet's just come in, but Ben Young started the autumn. Will Stewart is on the bench. Johnny Hill went on the 2018 tour. Marcus Smith had, had trained with England for two or three years. So this great relaunch that he's tried two or three times over three years just hasn't hasn't worked. It hasn't succeeded. He hasn't found a consistency of direction or message or style that has allowed England to evolve. And I think that's where, guys, the obsession with the 2023 World Cup 
ultimately was his undoing. And I feel for him in some respects because the RFU enabled him on this. But he was probably thinking when he spoke to you guys in the tunnel at Yokohama, Alex, Alex L, that, oh, I don't know who of these guys will be there in 2023. And I just don't think you can look four years ahead. I think you've got to go, well, this guy might make it. He might not. But at the moment, he's doing the business. Like, if you did that logic, Johnny Sexton would have been dropped five years ago, wouldn't he? If you were saying, can he make another one? Can he make another one? Because that's been a two-cycle thing with Johnny Sexton. It's been going on since sort of 2015, whether there's any backup. So I think if he only had a two-year deal or if there wasn't this World Cup obsession in 2023, he perhaps would have gone about things in a little bit more of an organic manner, not getting inside his own head the whole time about who's going to make it, who's going to make it. I should be dropping people. I should be making my move and just being a bit more clear in, and methodical in his decision making. I think it's this 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 looming target, this kind of obsession with Paris 2023 that I think has cost both him and the RFU to some extent. I think a lot of that obsession comes from the fact that he had a good start when he first took over England. Then he had a massive dip. But once he got into that World Cup, Cup camp, the resources that England have, the time that England have, and the way he was sort of to turn that team into, a, you know, the best England team that's ever played, I would say, is in that semi-final against New Zealand. Like, that to me is kind of what allowed this to happen, this obsession with 2023, with getting it right, the haunting of, you know, losing a final and, and really wanting that to be part of his legacy and World Cup winning, like, head coach on his CV sort of, you know, allowed him to just neglect a lot of the here and the now because he, in his mind, he's like, I'm just trying to get it right for there. And he also knows last time it wasn't looking great. I got my my guys together. I get the majority of my team fit. I take them all the way to the final and, and you know, it's game on again in 23. And I think this time the English public and the RFU like combined ran out of patience with him and didn't allow him to get to that sort of get out of jail uh, you know, moment that he might have been able to turn around at a World Cup, which I still think it would have been very possible once he had them for a long camp, that he still would have had a pretty successful World Cup. Yeah, I think it comes down to, to clarity, doesn't it? Like that that first two years, we knew exactly what that England team stood for. There was a clarity of message. Um, there was a clarity of, of game plan. And and it's a player like James Haskell, who had floated around with it without, without ever really having a direction, suddenly became a core member of that team because he was given a job and he went and did that job and they went and won a record equaling 18 games in a row. You fast forward to post-19, he's trying to rebuild and and there's no clarity at all. No, no one understands on the field or off it seemingly where they're trying to go, how they're trying to play. Eddie had sort of got in his own head about game plans, trying to predict the trends, got in his own head about selection and then would would pick a player... And then not just drop them, but drop them brutally in a way that it was really hard for those players to, to ever come back. And he might say that was a, a test. That was a test of character there. But it's it, it, there was nothing clear about it. There was no clear direction. And, and that's where we've ended up in that South Africa game. England get thumped. There's not one area of the game that, that they perform well in. And the crowd boo. And you never hear Twickenham boo. And it, it had got to that point that... And those people in the stadium were, were way more... Uh, patient than than the rugby public because they would actually decide to still go and pay the money. Lots of people had given up on it. They didn't want to spend the money. They didn't understand where the team was going and hanging it all on one game at the World Cup uh, as as the England women found at their World Cup was an enormous risk. Enormous risk because it goes wrong on one day you look back and what have you got to show for your efforts? Absolutely nothing. No, I, I agree. I think when you look at key aspects of England, say post-2019, losing Steve Borthwick, Neil Hatley, initially only replacing those two coaches with one coach in Mount, Matt Proudfoot, then eventually bringing Cockrell in the year later. That to me was a, you know, a handbrake on the continued progression. One man can't do the job of two guys, especially two very elite coaches in Borthwick and Hatley who are head coaches pretty much in their own right. I think, you know, if you ask me, like, I think England's set piece has gone back from where it was in 2019, even with now the two coaches in. You look at the turnover and attack coach. Is there continuity? Is there clear uh, uh, understanding and ambition in attack? The the, the turnover and defence coach. Is, is there a clear system and, and defence that England have? Like, 
all these issues sort of all accumulate, you know, over this three year period. And it's kind of like been a thousand paper cuts to the point where no one can tolerate Eddie anymore. And I think that's really interesting about the scrum and that symmetry with South Africa. Who was the starting front row in 19? Mako, Jamie George, Carl Sinclair. Who was the starting front row in 2022? Mako, Jamie George, Carl Sinclair. And that's no problem because they're all world-class players. They're all British Irish Lions. But through the course of those three years, Eddie Jones had been dropping them and bringing them back. So it's like, well, are they the four guys from 2019 or not? Should they have stayed or not? It feels like that was almost a sort of um, a simple, sim, 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 symptomatic of Eddie Jones's slightly muddled selection process when he couldn't quite decide does he want to stick or twist with certain people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like it's 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 easy to say he should have gone after 2019. Look, it's the RFU. Remember, we're only in this position because of the RFU botching their succession plan time and time again. And they've botched their succession plan because there's been ch- turnover in the RFU boardroom. There have been three or four chief execs on Eddie Jones's watch, haven't there? Ian Ritchie at the start, then Steve Brown, Nigel Melville temporarily, then Bill Sweeney. So Eddie Jones and his tenants had four direct line managers who have all had different ideas for how to have a succession plan post Eddie Jones. Ian Ritchie's was 2019 and out. Steve Brown's was 2021 and out. And then Bill Sweeney's was 2023 and out. So again, I don't think that has helped the whole picture to, to, turnover in the boardroom, turnover in terms of the 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 succession plan. And it's meant that actually, yep, yeah, England might land Steve Borthwing and might land their man and get their plan a little bit early. But it still felt that even now in 2022, it's all slightly being winged when the whole point <laughs> for me and Richie back in 2015, 2015, was to make sure that England never used to wing it again when it came to their head coach. Yeah, like completely. And, and and we've got to this point because of that. And we've got to this point because when England finished fifth in the Six Nations, it was waved through. All the excuses were were, were swallowed by the RFU and then regurgitated in a in a press release in a in a press release, blaming everything from the players' leg drive in the, uh, the breakdown in the Premiership isn't good enough to COVID restrictions that every team had to cope with. Simon Amor was sacked as attack coach. A hasty appointment after the World Cup because England had no plan as to what to do beyond the World Cup. Um, and then you get to 2022, Six Nations, the same results. They finished third, but they lost three out of five. And again, no scrutiny at all on that occasion, not even a review, just a, um, an immediate endorsement of where of where the project was going or this, this wonderful progress that was being made behind the scenes at the same time as England nearly blew a lead against Wales lost to Ireland, Scotland and France. But wonderful progress was evident behind the scenes. Between March and now, the RFU have have lost all confidence. And you've got to wonder where the, the level of scrutiny was in, in that review in 2022 Six Nations and the 2021 Six Nations to just swallow everything that was being told to them until the point when Twickenham is booing and suddenly... <sighs> They wake up and realize that that the the nation has 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 turned against them. No, very very interesting point, and I think that that's pretty apt when you look at you know how the sort of popular opinion swung. Like previously, they were just able to sweep stuff under the rug with these reviews, like never really address, addressing a lot of the issues. We talk like we don't even know for sure publicly who are on these reviews, who are making these decisions. And this last one feels very reactionary to the public outcry and the pressure, which just, I think, became insurmountable for any way to sort of keep continuing, sort of sweeping under the rug, these cracks or issues that have been developing over these last couple of years. That's what I think a lot of England fans will will struggle with. Not necessarily the fact that Eddie Jones has gone, but the fact that he was being enabled and being backed all the way until now. And some people go, well, hold on. If it was all about 2023, and I remember asking Bill Sweeney, and I've I've actually got a lot of time for Bill Sweeney. I think he's got an an enviable job at the moment with too many things on one person's plate. But he, I asked him in March 2021, 20 months ago, is this World Cup obsession a little bit too much? Conor O'Shea did a briefing with us when he was talking about 2027. 
You know, the same way Wayne Pivat was talking about 2027 the other day. Who wants to hear about 2027? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> for one. And I don't know how many fans are desperate to talk about something in how many years' time. Anyway, I think it, the RFU had been, you know, they'd been raised that it wasn't necessarily the right way of going about it. But because they backed Eddie Jones's vision, you can understand why Eddie Jones would turn around now and go, well, you know, you told me to do this and I was just doing it. So, yeah, there's there's, there's definitely that sort of level of confusion about why it, it's happened, it's happening now and not earlier and why the RFU have suddenly lost patience when perhaps the warning signs have been there over the, the last year or two. Massively. And I think that's a good place to transition to, you know, successor. Obviously, you know, we're in this position with no clear succession plan again. England have to scramble a little bit. Borthwick seems to be the front runner in a lot of people's, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the articles I've seen. Um, is that what you guys are hearing? Do you think the Borthwick thing is inevitable? Do you think they'll keep the interim in place for the Six Nations and adapt to, to the World Cup? Where, where do you see the succession plan going from where we're sitting right now? Alex can go first. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, so Richard Cockrell is in is in kind of interim charge, but that's that's really just to keep things ticking over for whatever an England head coach does between between international campaigns. He'll go and watch some make some games and talk to clubs and whatever. But will he get acting up? Pay? Hey? Yeah, oh, I'd hope so. It'd be quite a jump if he's uh, fulfilling any <laughs> yeah, so like... issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he he he's, he's in for a couple of weeks. Um, so this, this morning, so Tuesday morning was the board meeting that confirmed Eddie Jones' departure. T Tuesday afternoon, the RFU contacted Leicester to begin a negotiation process over Steve Borthwick. Um, their long, their shortlist uh, to replace Eddie in the summer had Steve Borthwick on it, had Ronan O'Gara on it, and had Scott Robertson on it. O'Gara has he turned them down? He, he withdrew, I should say, from the process. Has re-signed with with La Rochelle. Scott Robertson is on is on a New Zealand Rugby Union contract. And as much as many of us think he'd be the best person for it, um, it's highly unlikely New Zealand are going to release him from a contract when they would like him to stay in their system to potentially be the next All Blacks coach. Steve Borthwick has always been the most likely candidate. And we understand that today there has been contact with a club. Now, the negotiations won't be quick because... The likelihood is that Steve will want to bring with him to England two or three, at least, of his Leicester staff. I would say Allard Waters, um, his, whose job title is effectively head of strength and conditioning, um, but he is a critical member of that management team. Won the World Cup with South Africa in 2019. Uh, I think Kevin Sinfield will be wanted um, to run the defence. Potentially even Richard Wigglesworth, who... Um, who's still, I think, a registered player, Jonesy, but he's he's showing really impressive signs uh, as a young coach. So I, I could see ultimately four members of that Leicester coaching team moving over to England. The negotiation will be about how many of them come across immediately, how many of them maybe stay for the for the rest of the season, so that Leicester aren't in an in an enormous hole mid season. Um, plus, there'll be some some financial discussions to, to go through. So. I don't think England will have the exact team that Borthwick wants for, for the Six Nations, but it'll be a start and he'll probably use some of the current assistants with a full team being around for, for the World Cup warm-up uh, camp in, in the summer. Interesting, interesting. And do you think, so you think there's a strong chance that a lot of that backroom staff that's there at the moment will probably still be in place in the Six Nations? Uh, I, I'd say so at the moment. It depends how, how those negotiations go with Leicester. I mean, if, if the RFU are going to throw money at it, then Leicester will take the money and use that money to to repopulate their management team. But it's but it's really hard to do, to do that mid season. And the other thing, if you're running a business, you've got to realise that if if Leicester are at the moment competing for the for the playoff places, they're in the Champions Cup. If they lose the head of their coaching team or even the core of their coaching team the chances of them being involved in knockout rugby at the end of the season are massively diminished. That will have an impact on the amount of money that the club can earn. So these negotiations will be more than just compensation to get a coach out of his contract. Um, I would expect that you'll, you'll, you'll probably have one or two who have to remain for the Six Nations until a, a deal can be done where, where everyone that, that Borthwick wants on his team can come across. 
And I think this is where we want to hear a bit more from the RFU, and I'm sure we will in the fullness of time, about the reasons for sacking Eddie Jones. And if it's as straightforward as, look, the results haven't been good enough, time is up. Because if any England fan thinks there could be a really smooth transition of coaching team at this stage of the cycle, they're deluded. That's not going to happen. And Richard Cockrell acting up makes sense because it can at least mean there is a bit of continuity. Then Borthwick can come in when he's ready. They can drip people into that coaching staff when they're ready. But whatever happened, there was going to be some turbulence. If Warren Gatlin had come in, he would want to bring some people. If Scott Robertson had come in, he would maybe want his own. So by making a change at this stage of the cycle, there was always going to be some turbulence. So England fans might have to almost have a, a double hit this week, the kind of the shock of Eddie Jones going, and also maybe a Six Nations where the coaching team is still in a kind of transitional state before perhaps getting there only a few months before a World Cup. So the RFU have, have taken a huge call, not just to sack someone so decorated as Eddie Jones, but also to go with it, all of the coaching turbulence that will bring. Um, but I was thinking, you know, and in continuing the theme of just contradictions and mixed emotions when it comes to Eddie Jones, part of me thinks, oh, he's he's leaving one year too early. But part of me thinks it's a miracle he made seven years. You know, two years into his regime, he was picking fights left, right and centre. Um, and you thought he's not going to make 2019. And he did. And then wait again. So perhaps it was inevitable that he wasn't going to fulfil the full eight. And maybe seven of Eddie Jones is is pretty good going for any union. Uh, I agree. I, did anyone see that Lawrence Delalio interview he did from 2017 that was getting reposted on social media and talking about is after 2003? And the, it, it seemed like history just repeating itself when watching that, that this is kind of what the year two cycle of Eddie looks like. He's, he's honestly like his superpower is his intensity and his OCD and his, you know, obsession. But then it also can be his undoing over time because I think the reality is as someone who is a bit obsessive myself, not everyone thinks or operates like you. And in a position of leadership, you have to be able to adjust your tack and not try and force all these circles through a square shape as such to, to make a poor metaphor. And that seems to be one of the, one of the issues with Eddie. I, I think that's a, um, so we've talked all about Eddie and, and, and the fact that he came into this job going, I'll never repeat what I did with Australia, where he lost the world cup final and became fixated on the two on winning it in 2007 and ended up losing the team, losing eight games in a row and losing his job. And, and that interview you're talking about with Lawrence, he says exactly that. I would, I won't make that mistake again. Now, when when you're in it, when you're ready, when you're trying to, you're trying to rebuild a team, you, you've just lost another World Cup final. I can see why he he was determined to to plough on. It's where the questions about the advice around him. He was surrounding himself with people who he insisted were would challenge him at every step of the way. Neil Craig, Bill Sweeney, the chief executive. No one was actually challenging him going you're you're going down exactly the same path and you're committing the same mistakes you know stop you know where's the clarity where's the direction where is what made that that 03 Australia team so good where's what made the 19 England team so good he didn't have it's like he he didn't have the right advice around him either anyone to just go Eddie stop Look what you're doing. You're actually going down the same road you went down before, the road you didn't want to go down. And is that a symptom, do you think, of just not having, like, uh, like from my understanding, up to 2019, like, Borthwick was his right-hand man. Like, everything from the coaches went through Borthwick. He was a filter from Eddie to the other coaches. He was sort of the person that would push back against Eddie and and give him some of the, the harder truths that maybe he didn't want to hear. And and I'm not saying that he's surrounded by yes men now, but I don't see a clear person in that dynamic who is that same character to kind of keep Eddie Jones, maybe not like uh, on a leash a little bit and, and keep him, you know, where he needs to be. And I do think potentially not being challenged enough over this time is is an issue of why he's in this position now. Yeah, just touched on that. I, um, I actually texted someone who'd worked with Eddie Jones um, and talking about his use of his assistance. And I said something like... Uh, you know, is it a stupid question or did he not let his assistants have that much of a say? And he, the, the person replied, that's a stupid question. So it, it was kind of like a, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's again, that the, the sort of that, that cocktail of, of different emotions or different characteristics that make Eddie Jones the coach he is, but also 
are his weaknesses and faults as well. And and that's where perhaps a, a, a situation like this, an acrimonious end, a disappointing um, so it was slightly, slightly sad end because a lot of hard work has gone in and it, he won't get the chance to go to another big dance unless he gets another contract with another country, which is not impossible. So, yeah, you feel as if so many things that make Eddie Jones the coach that he is um, can also contribute uh, to his un- undoing as well, which makes him a really quite quite fascinating, almost like b- bewitching case study. You know, we're, we're not psychologists here, but he'd be an absolute psychologist's dream, wouldn't he? Just to psychoanalyze, get inside his head, find out what made him tick. And there was a line, I think Charles Richardson from The Telegraph did a piece with Paul Gustard, who'd worked with him for, what, three years as assistant coach, yeah. tours, long nights, all that stuff. And he said he didn't really know him at all. Doesn't that say a lot that he's worked with him morning, noon and night for three years and doesn't really know him? And I think that's maybe a problem why he sometimes doesn't get the advice he should get, doesn't have assistant coaches in his ear, doesn't have a really collegiate coaching team is because he's a very hard person to get very close to. Yeah. And, and I think that le- leads back to your point, Corbs, about the makeup of the of the coaching team. He, You said he's not surrounded by yes men. He's definitely surrounded by people who are grateful to, to have been given a job by him. And that's that's a real different dynamic to to that that period before the World Cup when Scott Wisemantle was in. And I actually think Scott Wisemantle, who was only there for a year, 18 months, never really never signed a contract. That's not how he really operates. He was the guy, sort of a free spirit surfer from uh, Queensland. He he would stand up to Eddie. He had, he had no problem doing it. John Mitchell came in, made a massive difference to England. There's, there's experienced senior coaches who would have tested... Eddie Jones, and they drove England from, I think, from the point, the big turnaround that, that where Chris talked about, the, the dodgy 2018, he pulled England out of that because he appointed John Mitchell and Scott Wisemantle, and they really drove England forward. Post-2019, like I mentioned, Simon Amor was a, was a rushed appointment. Um, Matt Proudfoot, I don't think South Africa were that fussed about him leaving to join England. He didn't run the, he didn't run the Springboks line out in 2019, so Proudfoot was there, and then and then we've had this rotation of, you know, Mitchell left, and uh, Anthony Seabold came in from the NRL, who was who was without a job. Um, his reputation in rugby league wasn't great at the time. Grateful, grateful to be appointed. Brett Hodgson, who we'll, we'll wait and see whether he takes over as defence coach, um, but he was a, a similar appointment. Coaches who were just pleased to have a job, and that backroom of England ten, became a kind of a launch pad for coaches to go somewhere else and work, which isn't what the England setup should be. People should be working to get a job in the England setup. Um, and, and I think that's that's affected the whole dynamic. Very, very well said, guys. I think that's a good place to, to wrap this up. Like, there's a lot to talk about, big news, but I think we've uh, broken it down pretty well. And I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about as a continued fallout over the next couple of days. But for, for Chris and Alex, thanks again so much for your time and, and good to get the squad all together on a podcast. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Good cool. to chat, guys. Loved it. Great to have those two on always. Lots of insight, very much in the know. And I think that's a pretty well-balanced assessment and breakdown of, of the Eddie Jones era legacy and where we are right now. And, and like I just said, I'm sure there'll be, you know, more revelations and things unfolding in the near future that need to be sort of broken down, especially with the coaching and the succession plans and how that evolves going forward with Steve Borthwick or whichever way the RFU decide to go. But then, you know, now it is time to turn our attention to the World Rugby 7 Series. It's a big Uh, year for the United States all the sevens teams really Olympic qualification is on the line the US teams are coming off the back of Dubai where they both had strong performances and we're here to speak with two of their captains Naya Tapper and Kayvon Williams we are joined by Naya Tapper and Kayvon Williams both captains of their US sevens teams respectively and coming in after the opening round of the World 7 Series, which obviously was in Dubai. That was on Peacock TV. And uh, we're in a great place to be welcomed by these two. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. Thank you so much. Oh, great, great. Obviously, you're both in uh, Cape Town now. So you've had a, a pretty brutal travel uh, schedule, I imagine, after the, the opening leg. It's, it's a long journey to turn around in a week. Yeah, um, I think for us, we kind of question having to leave so 
immediately after the tournament. But now looking back on it, getting to Cape Town and being able to get settled and have a couple and have a couple days to reset, I think was the best option for us and has allowed us to have some pretty good sessions following that. And who makes those decisions? Is that world rugby and is that what's dealt to you or is that more your team and your planning? Do you know? It's a bit of both. Um, I think it was, it planned out to be that the, the teams had three days to kind of get here and the teams kind of got their picks of what day. So I'm pretty sure we sele- our team selected that we get here a lot earlier so that we can get here and go ahead and rest. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been a little hectic, but we've settled in. All right. Well, let's talk Dubai and uh, we'll take turns uh, going back and forth. But Naya, let's start with you. Really, you know, great result for, for you and your team to, to come away with a bronze medal. You know, a few up and down performances, but the grit to beat France at the end in a big year with world, uh, with Olympic qualification on the line. You know, how good a start is that for you? Going into this tournament, one of our big goals is 100 points because we know if we get 100 points, we'll automatically qualify for the Olympics, which is one of our big goals. And so having that first tournament and being not only in top four, but being able to podium and and medal, um, we kind of exceeded our expectations in a way where, of course, you want to come here and get a gold medal, but to have that top four goal and get top three, um, that was really reassuring for us that the training that we had been doing was effective. Amazing. And, and Kayvon, similar situation for you, obviously not getting the third, but still in that top four bracket, which again, for you and your team is a big year, very competitive, uh, you know, men's pool. It goes very deep down with the teams that will be trying to get that top four spot. You know, how how you feeling after round one? Um, you know, we're feeling pretty confident, uh, pretty good. I mean, we hit our minimum standard. You know, our minimum standard is to, to win quarterfinals. You win quarterfinals, you're top four. Um, so we've done that. Um, but obviously you know, we, we, we want, we want the shiny things, you know, we want to, we want the first, uh, first place medal. Um, second and third is, is good too, but, you know, just, just barely miss, uh, out on the, on the actual final. And then, you know, had a, a tough one against New Zealand. So, uh, but I mean, ultimately we, we hit our goal, but we still, we still got some more to go. And then, so Naya, looking at you and, and your teammates, like where were you really happy with some of the performances on the field? Like what were some areas that maybe you, you have worked on as a team and are, are now at, uh, in, a good, in a good position that you feel like is translating on the field? I think one of the main things that we were focusing on going into the tournament is having a game plan when teams would kick to us deep because that was an area that we struggled in in the World Cup. So really honing in on that area and putting it into effect in the tournament allowed us to have um, a better impact. And then also like sticking to the plan in the past, we would have plans, but we wouldn't stick to them when things got chaotic, but we had a mind switch with that when we came to Dubai and with each team, we had a plan on how to beat them. And for the most part, we stuck to that. And I think that led to our success. Awesome. And, and what are some areas as a team that you've targeted on to continue working and that you want to maybe be better this weekend in Cape Town? Um, one of the areas we want to focus on is making sure that we're getting all our balls back on our kick receipts. We did have a little uh, a rough time with our pods um, because we focused so hard on those deep balls um, over the past couple months. And then another area we probably want to focus on is the ruck area, the discipline around that, because we did have a huge amount of penalties. Uh, great insight. And Kayvon, some of my questions for you and your team. You know, what were you happy with on the field? And then secondly, like what, what is a bigger work on for you guys coming into the this round two? Um, so I think very similar to kind of what Naya touched on was sticking to the game plan. Um, you know, we get in these games and, you know, we often lose these games. And we come back and we say, what, what did we do wrong? And we go back and we look at it. It's like, well, we said we we're going to do this. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And then you look at the game and you're like, well, we didn't do we didn't do these things. But you go back and look at the actual games where you actually do what you set out to do and stuck to the plan the entire game. Um, those games kind of end up a little bit better for you. So um, I think that's kind of our, our game plan. You know, we game plans switch up depending on who you play all the time. Um, so it's just about whatever we say we're going to do that game, sticking to that. Um, and like leading into this tournament, I think we got a few areas we want to touch up on. We kind of got we got a pinged for quite a few uh, penalties, especially like in that Ireland game for being offsides um, and uh, getting hit up on the blind side a little bit um, throughout the tournament. So we've kind of been practicing and working on those things a little bit. But those are kind of the things we kind of uh, got in front of us. 
Nice. And then, Naya, for, for, for you, you know, you, what do you make of your pull this weekend and uh, the opportunity to play in Cape Town? Sevens is very unpredictable. So, it re- like, the pool that you get, it, there's not any expectations that you can put around it because you never know what those teams are going to bring, regardless of what they showed you the weekend before, the year before, five years before. So with us, we kind of just want to focus on one game at a time in that first game being against Japan, figuring out what we need to do against them and then going from there. Nice. And then same to you, Kayvon. Um, Looking at the pool ahead, you know, we have um, Australia, GB and Uganda. And, you know, I mean, I just think we're just going to back ourselves, you know, um, you kind of, you kind of get these pools and, you know, right now the world series is like nine teams are kind of in the mix right now. And every pool is going to be a hard pool. And you just kind of got to back yourself and just say like, just as, as well as these other teams are doing, that these teams got to come see us too. They got to come play us just like we got to come play them. So I think we're, we're doing all right. We, we're feeling pretty confident going into the weekend. No, oh, great stuff. And then Naya, you know, touching see on your Instagram, you had a picture of you and Kayvon, you know, talking about representation and, and everything in the sport. You two are amazing sort of ambassadors for the sport and and sort of hopefully inspiring a, a new generation. You know, how exciting it is to be a leader. You've been on this team for a while and, and now you're finally in a position of leadership. Yeah, I think I, the main thing that I want to be an example of is that you don't have to be perfect to be in a leadership role. I'm speaking specifically from my experience where my journey has had a lot of um, rough moments for me internally um, and externally. So showing people that no matter what situation you're set up in, no matter how you're raised or like how you think mentally if you want to change those things to put yourself in a position to be a leader, you can do that. And specifically just being a Brown person, showing people that there's opportunities out there. And if you work hard, you can make those available to yourself. Uh, it's, it's a bit amazing. And obviously, you know, just seeing you over the years, some of your personal growth and to see you in that leadership role now, it, it, it is inspiring and congratulations. And Kayvon, somewhere for you, you're a key cog in this team. I think since like the generational change over the last two years with some of the older guys retired, you've really stepped up into that one of those key leadership roles and, and turning into a big game player. Like how, how much of is that a, a, an amazing honor for you as well? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it is, you know, to kind of, uh, kind of get that role um, and the guys kind of get behind you. I, I don't know, man. I, I try to just kind of look at myself as like the same guy, the same person. I, I've always been on this, the team, you know, um, now I'm in the captain seat. I, I just get asked a few more questions, but like, like who I am and and like kind of what I'm doing is kind of like who I've always kind of been on the team, um, whether I had the role or not. Um, so it's, it, I mean, for me, it's it's it's, it's kind of normal. I just get asked a few more questions, uh, but you know, it does mean a lot. You know, you, people people get to see different types of people in the, in these roles, and it, it can be inspiring to a whole different generation of people. Awesome. Now, it's great to see. I think you're, you're great ambassadors for the sport and, uh, you know, wishing you all the best this weekend. But before we let you go, a few little fun questions. I'm going to put you both on the spot. I'm going to ask you a, a characteristic about uh, someone and you're going to tell me who in your team uh, is the most of that characteristic. So we're going to we're going to start with. All right. Now, we'll start with you. Who is the loudest on the team? Loudest on the team is Alona Mar. <laughs> <laughs> loud and proud i can imagine Kayvon, who is the loudest mate um loudest person on our team hands down is aaron cummins ac he he will not shut up <laughs> <laughs> all right next one our next one all right and this one you know it says but you know who is the biggest complainer on your team naya who loves the moan the biggest complainer would be nana fa desi <laughs> she's gonna <laughs> kick my butt for that but oh well <laughs> Same to you, came on, mate. Man, you setting me up. Um, uh, this is what we do on the scrum down. Hey, don't tell him I said this, but it's probably gonna be Steve and Tom Hussein. Like Steve, Steve, <laughs> he complained quite a bit, man. But you know, that's my he my boy though. But yeah, yeah, mate. Um, it's not in a bad way. Some guys just love to moan, man. I I feel like all oh, girls. Apologies. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Um. Okay. Next. Next one. All right, this one's a bit nicer. Who is the funniest on the team? Ooh. 
aside from myself, I think I would say uh, maybe Kayla Connect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little Kayla, man. Yeah. Good on her. Good on her. All right, Kayvon, who are you going with? Um, so this is somebody that people, most people wouldn't kind of think is like one of the funnier people on the team. But uh, Tala, Fight Tala, Tala Pussy, he is, he's quite the character. He don't say much in like a big setting, but you get him in like a small room with just like a few people and he won't shut up and he is funny as heck. All right, last last one. All right, last one. Who is the angriest on the field? Some people, you know, you get some, you get some that are just angry on the field. Who's the angriest on the field? Uh, if that wasn't me, I think it would be. Uh, I'm gonna say Kayla Kinnett again. She's getting rinsed, mate. Get on it. Nah, good. All right, Kayvon. You know, I, I definitely have my times of being pretty angry while we're out there, but I try to keep my composure a little bit more. But I'd probably give it to Perry. Perry, he he <laughs> play he just plays with so much passion that, you know, it, it when he when something happens and it kind of messes up, he, he does get a little angry, but it's not because he's just furious, it's because mad, it's just because it's just the passion behind wanting to be at right about uh, and get everything right. Uh, awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, I've taken enough of your time. You've got a big week ahead. Uh, good luck this weekend out in Cape Town. We'll be rooting for you. And uh, thanks again for your time to both of you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for having us. Ah, good to have them on. I uh, had to hit them with a little bit of banter at the end, but also you know, hopefully some good insight. And, and like we said, wishing them all the luck this weekend as they take on uh, Cape Town in the World 7 Series and you know, hopefully they continue that momentum of top four finishes is what they're both after as they look ahead to this next event. But for everyone here, that is a wrap on this week's Scrum Down. I hope you enjoyed it. Kind of meshed some of the US-centric news with what's going on more in the global game, trying to hit all the touch points. A reminder to keep checking out, if you haven't already, our last two episodes were sit-down interviews with USA Rugby CEO Ross Young, talking through a lot of the problems that the union faces off the back of the men's 15 team not qualifying for the World Cup. And, you know, we get a lot of good insight there. There's a lot of change potentially happening behind the scene with World Rugby getting more involved. So I'm sure as well, there'll be lots more to continue to analyze and break down as we go forward. But for everyone, thanks again for the support. Keep liking, sharing, favoring, um, you know, commenting on our social media, really trying to promote the pod and, and keep growing it. And I uh, really appreciate all your support. For now, that's all from us. And we'll see you again next week.